Hello and welcome to Need to Know, your weekly investment podcast brought to you by the experts here at Coots. I'm Ben Allen. I lead the financial sponsors and executives team here at the bank. This week, we are joined, as always, by Coots CIO, Alan Higgins. Hello, Alan. Hey, Ben, how are you doing? Nearly always. We do have some 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 other experts here at Coots that, that do it, but it seems, yeah, it seems I've got the job and it's it's great to have you on while Sarah's on holiday. You're just kept trying to catch me out there. You're showing that I don't listen every single week, which I nearly do, but maybe not all of them. Um, but to those regular listeners, we will you will know each week on the podcast, we look at the three things investors need to know, uh, not just for the week ahead, but as, as well for some longer term trends. Now, some of you may be listening at a time when there is trouble going on in the world. Um, this call is very much about markets and investments not the geopolitical issues, which are clearly very, very difficult. And uh, we appreciate on a lot of people's minds at the moment. But this is about our fiduciary responsibility to manage our clients' money. So that's what we'll be focusing on today, very much the investments and the market side. Um, So before we get into the detail, let's just dwell a bit, Alan, on last week's episode. So I think you were talking about the potential risks to capital from short selling. And we always love to hear from clients. I understand that uh, someone's been in touch to say that short selling can lose all of your capital. Is that something you just want to clarify? Yes, Ben. A couple of people were in touch. Uh, Coots client, Peter, he absolutely gave me permission to disclose his name. In fact, his full name, but I'll spare his blushes. Peter absolutely made a great point. Um, You can lose all your money unlimited from short selling. I stopped at minus 45%. Because I believe that's what the hedge fund manager, his name's Gabe, uh, did lose on his fund. But yeah, you might write to point that out, Peter. A couple of other people got in touch as well. Yeah, so you were also talking about the uh, the origin of why gilts are, are free of CGT capital gains tax. So I believe you were sort of zipping up your boots and going back to your roots, reminiscing about your your first job in the city in 1986. It was 1986. And my first boss, Robert, uh, nice to hear from you. Hope you're well, got in touch. And he he did actually say it was very common prior to July 1986, when gilts became CGT free, for institutions like ours to basically sell gilts at a loss and get tax loss. What yeah. he disputes, though, is that after two, after two weeks sitting next to him, I was buying and selling bonds like a, a young Warren Buffett. He said there was far more controls over me. Um, Who is someone very wise, sadly no longer with us, Ben, said, recollections may differ. Yes, that's right. That is a very well... Who was that? Uh, That was the late Queen. Recollections may differ. There there you go. There you go. So, uh, classic. I do remember my... uh, I'm coming up on 25 years here at the bank, and uh, my first two weeks, I remember very clearly, it was about... um, Victorian frock coats, long lunches, but uh, the story is another time, I think. Shall we move on? What do we need to know this week, Alan? One more, sorry, a head, uh, sorry one more. A hedge fund manager did also get in touch. Andrew, thank you for that. Uh, this this guy's a potential client rather than a client, so I must mention him because it, it, he pointed out what happened to Gabe afterwards because we didn't mention that. He got money from the two people in the film, one of which is Ken Griffin. Didn't work out, closed down, so not a good story. He said, don't feel sorry for him, though. Very large family office. Ben, we're in the wrong jobs. (laughs) We should have been hedge fund managers. Absolutely. Well, there's still time, isn't there? We're still young. There's still time for us. Yeah. But anyway, getting on to the the three things need to know. So, as you know, Sarah, Sarah came up with this idea and forces me and others to come up with three things. I thought we had an important piece of data. Yeah. But um, both you and I listen to podcasts quite late, don't we? We do. So often the, the timing isn't uh, isn't precise enough to the minute. Yeah. So we're kind of moving away on this podcast from the employment report was exactly this. And therefore, we're going to put it in a broader sense, but cover the US employment report. And more generally, why is the US economy so damn resilient? One. Yeah. So cover that. Um, going back to gilts, we covered gilt CGT free. Uh, again, a bit of feedback. Can we cover what it's, you know, owning a fund? versus yeah. owning gilts directly and holding to maturity. And by mm-hmm. the way, this could be US treasuries, but uh, gilts are particularly interesting for our UK clients. Then thirdly, um, went to an interesting conference this week, um, Ruffer. Many of our clients yeah. work with Ruffer. 
um, very bearish, and also a nice piece from Goldman Sachs here. Um, also very bearish, basically a, a thousand of their clients and their views. So I thought once again we'd cover the bear case for risk assets and just have a little look at it. Yeah, that sounds good. So quite a lot to cover. Uh, on the latter point, the sort of 1987 style scenario, a lot of articles on this in various newspapers over the weekend. So uh, it probably is on a lot of people's minds. So it'd be good to cover that. So should we start with the uh, the data then and what we've seen from the US? But with the context, we're not talking about what's going on day to day. Quite, quite. But I mean, basically... Uh, firstly, it's all about the states. Uh, so you, look, the UK is a concern, but for investment portfolios, it's about the states. And and there's there's two big numbers every month: inflation, of course, and the next one is the US employment report, so-called non-farm payroll. And, and and yeah, sorry, Ben, you wanted to say something. So I was just going to say the the non-farm payroll. So that's a sort of key economic indicator. It's, it's released by. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's 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 the first Friday of the month, isn't it? And it's this sort of snapshot of the the labor market, and it's a critical bit of information for economists, policymakers, investors, and so on. Quite, and you're quite right. You know, non-farm payroll. Why do we call it? We should just call it a jobs report in in, in essence, because but basically, it was the strongest since January, and also there were revisions upward to previous months, and the revisions naturally tend to be more accurate. So, I mean, the big picture is um, the unemployment rate stayed at 3.8%, very strong non-farm payrolls or employment growth. So Ben, just the US economy is so darn resilient. It really is. Yeah, so I read 336,000 jobs added in the US last month. So much more than than expected. So as you're saying, despite the higher interest rates, that economy is, is, is remaining resilient. What's going on? So uh, I thought, we'd, I mean, like a lot of things, Ben, we have theories. We, we can't prove anything. A couple of theories and kind of linked in. There was an interesting article in the FT. It was more focused on Europe, but it kind of brought it home about um, comparing the various European housing markets. Mm. You know, I wonder, what, what am I doing talking about Europe when we're just talking about US? I'll, I'll come back to that. And, and also, I want to talk about the corporate sector. But the reason, of course, um, why the US economy or one reason the US economy may be more resilient the US economy has 30 year fixed mortgages. Yeah. And a lot of them at three to four percent. And I don't know, Ben, you've done a few mortgages. What's the longest you've seen at Coots? I have back in the day. So um we uh, we've seen a few at 10 years. Not really beyond that, but we're talking way up, aren't we? Yeah, and, and I guess at Coots and elsewhere in the UK, it's more a two and five year fixed market, right? Two and five year, just seeing some shorter term stuff as well, but uh but yeah, I think what you're referring to is this, the article that UK homeowners are among the most exposed due to a combination of higher rates. So um, you're comparing Bank of England benchmark rate uh, 5.25 against Europe, which is four. Uh, and quite a few people in, in the country are, are affected by this, aren't they? So uh, over a million British households, I think they're quantifying it. Yeah, at. yeah. And it just puts it in contrast to the States, because a lot of our listeners who are focused on the UK think, oh, my God, this is tough. Yeah. Tough for especially younger people. Interestingly, um, I hadn't realised a um, couple of little little facts from this. Spain, we will get back to the point, but it's just an interesting yeah. article. Spain is the home of variable rate mortgages, old fashioned variable rate mortgages. Remember those? Mm -hmm. 75%. And this I can't believe. We're going to have to get Sven on, our resident German, to, to cut all things German. Germany, few limits on loan to income ratios. I thought there was laws about any, everything in German. Uh, you know, we're going, to, we're, going to have to, we're going to have to look into debt. But the point being, housing's a real problem for consumers in the UK. Yeah. Sounds like in Spain um, and, and in Europe generally, you know, there are, there are some longer term fix. But in the United States, just not an issue. Not yeah. an issue. And then finally, um, kind of linked to that, the, the corporate sector has done a pretty good job at responding to the low rate regime. So to give you a flavour, if you look at S&P 500 companies, pre the financial crisis, they were about 40% in fixed rate bonds. Mm. Now they're up at 75%. Mm. And those fixed rate bonds are obviously low coupons, a bit analogous to the mortgage. 
So look, yeah. one reason why the US economy may be holding up better is it's a bit more resilient to rates than it used to be. Yeah. But we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep an eye on it. I mean, by the way, uh, when I come to talk about Ruffer, they have a completely different view. We'll come to that. Um, yeah. It's a, impressive, the resilience. There's a bit of a conundrum going on. At the moment. It's, it's, it's changed a bit. I know we're deliberately trying not to be day to day, but the um, when this came out, the benchmark 10-year Treasury yields in the US, I think they were highest level for 16 years following that release and, and uh, stock markets declined on Wall Street. So it's all about whether the Fed would raise uh, would raise rates further in the months ahead. But then obviously the, the ge- geopolitical situation has had, a, had an effect on that since then, hasn't it? It has. Plus Fed officials have come out and basically said, mm, maybe we're done. And they're getting a bit edgy about this rise in bond yields. You're right. Um, the market looked at that initially and said, wow, US rates need to go a lot higher. But yeah. um, I'm not so sure. I, I think there is a lag effect here. There always yeah. is a lag effect and, and employment is a lagging indicator. Look, I stand by what I said earlier. I see the US economy as being fairly resilient as it stands mm. today. But um, there has been a lot of tightening. So, yeah, we'll come back to it. But I think the main message for... People who, ha- who see pessimism here in Europe and especially the UK, it's not quite like that in the States. Yeah, uh, I think a few people have commenting. So Jason Furman, I was reading the former chair of the White House Council of Economic Advisors under Obama. He was saying the first reaction was shock. The second reaction was nervousness. And on further reflection, he says this could be quite good because we could be in the middle of a sustainable increase in labour supply was his take on this. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we shall see. I mean, normally when the Federal Reserve or any central bank does this degree of tightening, then there's a price to be paid. Now, we have seen some prices to be paid. We've seen Silicon Valley Bank, haven't we, Uh, for example, go under. But um, we shall see. But we will come back to the US economy and inflation's obviously out later this week. And um, so it's not just about it. but, But for now, the US economy is resilient. Yeah, and the Fed meeting on Halloween, which uh, interpret that as as you will for their next uh, rate setting meeting. But um, some recent dovish comments. We'll have to see where where that goes. So um, the other thing you were just dwelling on the the mortgage market. So more people taking out thirty five year mortgages. Did you did you read this in the, in the uh, newspaper Standard Term? Obviously twenty five years, but. Bank of England uh, worrying that people may struggle with debt in future as a result of that. I did see that in the UK, but that will have a twist, won't it? It'll be not 35-year mortgages like the US. It'll be 35 with two-year and five-year fixed thrown in, won't it? Within it, yeah, it's the, absolutely. It's, it's the term, whereas in the United States, it's 30-year fixed. Yeah. And a lot of people are paying three or four on yeah. their mortgage. And, they're, and they're, they're, they're beautifully locked in at three or four. So our mortgage, I mean, it's long been a desire to get a 30-year fixed mar- market going here in the UK. Mm. Um, it would be nice. Um, the reason it works in the United States is they have federal institutions that help to make it work. Fannie Mae yeah. and Freddie Mac, they're called, amongst others. But um, yeah, I, I, I think, um, look, the US looks strong here, simple as this. And by the way, those job gains, uh, leisure and hospitality were dominant. Uh, and it goes to show, you know, post-COVID, leisure and hospitality is what people want to do. Yeah, yeah. So a complete uh, sort of change in, in priorities. You know, you're right. And the way people work as well. We're seeing that uh, quite a lot, aren't we? Um, so should we move on from uh, from the US and, and what's going on? Should we, should we talk about gilts a bit more? Yeah. So we covered them in depth last week. Uh, ben, did you enjoy listening to that? By the way, the guilt part. I did. It it was very good. You were you were on top form as ever. That's very kind of you. It was well much briefer this time. Um, just kind of answering a specific point, more from colleagues than clients. But an interesting point is that okay, so guilt's held to maturity, especially short dated guilt's versus you know a guilt fund or a guilt index ETF. Pros and cons. So just just go through it. Um, so gilt's held to maturity. Again, I'll, I'll use an example of gilt. UK gilt 0.25 of Jan 25. Hmm. So about 14 month 
money, if you like. Think yep. of it as a 14 month equivalent deposit. Yep. So, um, and in Jan, it's the 31st of Jan, 31st of Jan 25, you'll get 100 back. You'll get your 100 yep. back. And along the way, you earn 0.25% of income and you get taxed on that. But this is the point, of course, it's priced at 94 and a half. So, what you can see, and, and obviously, this is completely obvious from all our listeners, is you have certainty of return. 94 mm-hmm. half to 100. Well, unless the UK defaults. If the UK yes, defaults, so I'll- buying a gilt and holding it to maturity is, is one of the, the few assets, I can't think of many more other than cash, obviously, where you know exactly what you're going to get at the end of the term albeit not in real terms. Good point. And, and look, and as always, I'm, I'm well known uh, in Coots, aren't I, Ben, for being an equity market bull. Yes. Equities for the long run, absolutely. But we're talking about something very specific here. So yeah. absolutely certainty of return, unless the UK government defaults. And if the UK government defaults, we've got a massive problem uh, in, in, uh, in all kinds of things. But... Um, so, so there's that. Whereas if you buy a fund or an ETF, it's yep. a stuck duration. Yep. So duration being interest rate risk, Ben. And and it's and it in the UK it tends to be particularly high. It's stuck at 10. Mm. So this is inside, for example, and this is no criticism, you know, we use it, but classically inside the Vanguard products, you know, index ETFs, duration of 10. What does that mean? I mean, it's not all bad, but less certainty. Of, of return and and these types of products have had big losses over the last couple of years because how it works is this then is that um if interest rates go up another one percent you lose ten percent capital yeah now you the income on gilts is about four to five so that helps to offset a bit but you lose ten percent capital sounds horrible but there is a flip side march 2020 deep recession gilt yields plunge so this time gilt yields fall 1%, you make 10%. Yeah. So you make 10% plus the 4 or 5% income and you're up 14 or 15. So you can see there is a role to, to be played for, for longer dated gilts, especially mm. as a hedge against a deep recession. Yeah. But um, I would argue we're not quite there yet. It's still a really nice environment for the certain return of owning a basket of short dated gilts. Or by the way, corporate bonds also work, but obviously... There's credit risk on, on corporate bonds. A basket of short dated bonds, absolutely certainty. And just one for the geeks, like one for the geeks. The calculation of redemption yield includes an, an assumption of how you reinvest the income. The nice thing about these low coupons, it becomes almost irrelevant. So even the geeks are happy, Ben. <laughs> and we like to keep the, keep the geeks as happy as possible, don't we? Absolutely. We do, because otherwise they will be in touch. They will be in but touch. But it is interesting, though, isn't it? I mean, this, I know this isn't just the uh, the funds, but it's also, it also applies to the individual gilts, but big returns in 2020, but significant losses in 2022, sort of outside of their normal role as the ballast in, in, in the portfolio. But um, all about the, the interest rates and the fund nav moving in the, in the opposite direction, as you say. Um, so... I mean, pros and cons to both. Would, would you buy the individual gilts or the fund, personally? So, um, representing the Coots view right now, not very heavy in gilts, um, which I agree with. Um, this is not all about the Coots view, but I just think it's super attractive for the cash or semi-cash element of a client portfolio, yeah. especially a taxpayer, to earn short-dated gilts directly. It's super attractive. I think what is dangerous, Ben, and, and you, me, and the team need to really work on that is is not to put equity money into this. Yeah. Um, because equity money, which for 10, 10 equity type risk, 10, 20, 30 years, passing on to multiple generations, equities have time and time again proved to be the best, uh, the best asset class. It's in my days as a, it all really seemed years ago, it's only about sort of three or four years, as a wealth manager, it would always be a sort of positioning discussion, cash for really short term stuff. And then, as you say, your sort of 12, 18 month money at the moment, that's where the short dated gilts are really looking attractive. And you've got certainty and some, some decent yields to maturity on those. And then the longer term stuff, because you can't try and time the market, that's where the, the equities come in and superior performance over the long term. Oh, I sound like a salesman there. 
Well, or an advisor, should we say? Yes, well, we kind of are, but look, uh, this is this is not advice. You, you've got exactly. the Sarah New disclaimer at the end, uh, absolutely, coming, and it's not taxation advice either. But look, um, I, you know, it is quite amazing how many people don't know about this opportunity. So yeah. this is the second week we're talking about it, but a bit more briefly this week. But the the, the main thing is when you're in a fund, the duration's constantly ten. I know the yeah. geeks will tell me now that ten varies a bit with convexity. Yeah, we'll save that for another podcast. But um, basically, you're a constant 10 duration, whereas you don't have, whereas what, if you have short dated bonds that mature, I think you put it beautifully, Ben, you have that um, as, as about as low risk as you, can, as you can get alongside deposits. Yeah. OK. Anything else we want to cover on this before we... Uh... No, I think we were short of this. We were, we were on this time on gilts. And yeah, I do dispute, uh, Robert, I was buying and selling gilts within two and a half weeks of being on the film. I'm pretty sure that, you know, come back and berate me again. It... Do you remember it or not? Do you remember enjoying that experience or being scared witless? No, I enjoyed it. I was a little bit scared because the, the, the numbers were large, but to be fair, there was some supervision. To be fair to the venerable institution of Sun Alliance Investment Management and Sun Alliance Insurance Group, there was, there, of course, there was supervision and there was... Um, there was senior people on the phone. It's just quite funny because just my boss went on holiday basically as soon as virtually as soon as I arrived. So I had to, it was a two person team, Ben. You know, so it's like me. That was a very you know, early demonstration of, uh, of trust in your judgment there, wasn't it? Well, yeah, yeah, you know. It was, All right. It hasn't um, always been right. I'm an investor. Investors get things wrong. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, you learn the hard way sometimes, do you? Right. Um, are we on the verge of a of a market crash? So you went to Ruffa. There are various articles in in the press. Um, Ruffa were were a bit scared, weren't they? Yeah. Look. Um, so I went to the Ruffa conference. Um, to be clear, excellent firm. Uh, th do things differently to us, um, but um, really thoughtful firm and had a tremendous twenty twenty two, where they navigated the the bear market really well. Um, so don't take this in any way as a criticism of them. And, and also, I've got um, a Goldman Sachs piece of research based on their basically client survey. And yeah, so I just thought I'd represent the bearish case. To be honest, there's lots of bears out there. JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley. It's harder to find a bull. Next week, I'll, I'll come back with a bull. But the bearish case from Ruffer is predicated on one recession is coming. In, yeah. And we're talking about the States, by the way, but also the UK. Recession is coming. Inverted yield curve. Uh, that's the situation where short rates are higher than longer term rates. Um, that's such a reliable indicator. Yeah, I broadly agree uh, with that. Um, the only thing I would say, it's been the most widely anticipated recession ever. That brings risks to big drawdowns. The second thing, which is a bit, which was really interesting, is that inflation hasn't gone away. Mm. Inflation won't. And, and oil again, energy prices not not yeah. going to help. So energy that. prices is one thing, but I think it's more. Structural bearishness on inflation. I don't know because um, I've talked about inflation before. Uh, I'm a big believer in the money supply. It was growing at 25% in the US um, when we had the inflation. Um, Larry Summers famously was, was, was a big critic. Um, now it's negative year over year. So I, I would take issues with that. And the third reason was risk premium, very, very narrow, which is a fancy way of saying equities are very expensive versus bonds mm. to a certain extent uh, and certainly some stocks in the US maybe but you know expensive for the right reason but go away from the United States no I would completely disagree and then finally yeah uh, 1987 was mentioned yeah now we covered 1987 in one podcast and I think um I, I would really take issue with that because I'll to just to give you some numbers because I know it well 1987 a PE ratio of 20 played 10 year bond yields at 10 and a quarter. So imagine that, Ben. Invest in 10 year treasuries, you're earning 10 and a quarter percent a year. Yeah. That's an equity return. You don't need to do anything else. So that was ridiculously extreme risk premium. Today, we've got four and three quarters, roughly. A big difference. A PE ratio of 20. So I just don't see the extremeness to justify 1987 type comparisons. So I would, I would, and I would, and I've said before, 10% correction. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
Well, probably well, happens most years, years though, doesn't it? A ten percent, actually, if you look at look at it statistically. Exactly, Ben. Ten percent correction. But um, so that's that's what I take issue with. But this is the other thing. So Goldman Sachs looking at it now. It's called their marquee views. They they've polled more than one thousand institutional investors. Okay, the S and P five hundred is currently about four thousand four hundred, but only one in four seeing it be above that level at year end. Mm. They're, so 75% see it lower. Just in my experience, Ben, the consensus view or the crowded view, if that is one, tends to be punished. The crowd is rarely right, unfortunately, in, in financial mm. markets. So I would push against that. And if anything, um, look, I, I also have been looking for a 10% correction. But I would say, well, having just seen this Goldman's report, and it's so bearish... Plus, coming back from rougher, I think the pain trade is equities go higher into year end, and maybe the ten percent correction is not till next year. Interesting. And the other school of thought that obviously a few people have been saying is that um, bond markets won't stabilise until there's this equity correction as well. Yeah, that's fair. I think, um, although more worryingly, they tend to move together. So as we speak, equities and bonds are going up together. But, you know, a week ago, it was equities and bonds selling off a bit together. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, for, for, equi for bonds to really work, we, you know, we, you know, like March 2020, when bonds really worked and protected the portfolio. Yeah. Going back to that duration 10 element. I think I think you're right. We, I think I think we need a, a, a fairly serious sell off, probably a, a minus 10 to minus 20. But given this positioning, um, uh, then I would say. The like, you know, the likes of, and they're not, they're not alone, of course. Rougher, um, they may have to wait patiently into next year for their correction. But uh, you know, look, this is out of full respect to Rougher because they have done an outstanding job of making returns when nearly everyone else is losing money. Um, and this year they're down when everyone's making money. So it's it's, it's actually quite an interesting portfolio diversifier. Yeah. And uh, not that this isn't advice. Obviously, we're not making any any recommendations on that point. We must uh, we we must be quite clear. Double, dis that. double disclaimer, Ben. Absolutely. Um, what's the IMF position on this? Jeremy Warner and Telegraph. Middle East war looming. Energy prices once more spiking. Governments drowning in debt. He sort of backs up this theory that we're heading towards another financial crisis. Look. I've learned not to be complacent about these things, but you, you mentioned kindly when I was a very, very young man, I started my career in 86. So that's a long time. I've only seen four big crises. So they're rare. Uh, yeah. 87 crash, tech boom, 2000, 2002, financial crisis, 08, 09, and March, 2020, yeah. uh, pandemic. They're rare. Uh, and yeah. um, I do think uh, the Telegraph is notoriously, they've got some phenomenal journalists, Ambrose Evans, Pritchard and the likes who are there. Really good analysis. But dare I say they have a bearish bias? Yeah. Again, I think it's much more logical to look for minus 10% type corrections than this end of the world. And, and as we know, normal, come on, you eat humble pie. Nearly impossible to get the timing right as well. So uh, normally better to, to remain invested. Coming back to the earlier point about positioning and having your short term cash they're ready if you need it. That's that's the way to play it. That's the way to play it from 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 our perspective. We we, we offer that as a firm, and it, and it's it's backed up by history and data. Yeah. The yeah. equities compound in the long run, and other risk premium do. It's not just about equities, but um, uh, that's mainly what we're talking about here today. So so absolutely right. And yeah, I I certainly learned the hard way trying to be a macro timer is so so difficult um because yeah. i do say sometimes ben imagine you know if if you and i uh, you know went out uh, you know started a little boutique and said to everyone we've got this great uh program uh for macro trading and we're going to keep you in equities when the market's going out we're going to get you out when it goes down backed by great grass and data etc you and i could probably raise some money because that's what clients want to hear but the real world is not like that to their credit, though, Ruffa somehow is one of the few that have kind of managed to make it work. But there's really not many. 
And it also depends on um, when you look at it, doesn't it? It's a bit, bit like the, uh, the stopped clock being right twice a day. But um, we, can, um, we, can, we can compare and contrast those, those different approaches. All right, um, we're just approaching the end of the podcast. Any other thoughts before we wrap up today from you, Alan? No, I don't think so. I've enjoyed talking to you, Ben. It's been it's been great. Poor old Sarah will be worried she'll be out of a job. But no, very important to get the disclaimers in. Uh, um, but apart from that, I think um, I will next week. Obviously, I'm going to try and find someone's heart. I'll try and find a bull to, to, to do the bull case again. That would be good. That'd be quite interesting. I shall be listening to see what you come up with. Of course, Sarah is absolutely irreplaceable i'd never dream of uh of, of taking that role from her so thanks for being enlightening as usual uh the normal disclaimers obviously a reminder the views expressed in this podcast are not intended to constitute investment or tax advice either they are accurate at the time of recording and they are of course subject to change thank you alan very much for joining me today don't forget to check out the podcast page on coops.com and you can subscribe to this podcast by any of the usual main platforms. Take your pick on those. Sarah will be back with you next week. So until the next Need to Know, this is Ben Allen heading back to the cold face of the financial markets. And it's goodbye from me for now.